Do you have John 21? Well, Miss Rachel does. Do you have John 21? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let's stand together. And uh, Hey, we are at church. And if you didn't, in case you didn't know that, we are at church. And we are in church. It's happening right now. And, uh, and so church is going on. And so uh, let's uh, do our best to act like it. And uh, let's, we already drove here. We already got here. And uh, let's go ahead and let's just have church. Amen? Amen? John 21. I just want to read one verse. John 21, verse 10. John 21 and verse 10. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Read that verse with me out loud. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Pray with me and pray for me. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that you help us. God, I appreciate you giving us the Word of God, and I pray that you will speak to us from it. Uh, Lord, I know that we've been singing about you. We've been singing to you, uh, I hope. And God, we've come and had altar prayer where we could talk to you and, and, uh, and give you thanks and give you glory for what you've done in our lives And Lord, I pray now, as we have spoken to you, I pray you will speak to us. I pray you will open up this Bible. I pray you will uh, talk to our hearts tonight. Lord, I know that uh, your people are here, and I pray that you bless us. I pray that you open up the Bible to us in a special way. Encourage us. uh, Give us instruction. Give us reproof. Give us doctrine. uh, Give us instruction in righteousness. God, I pray that you help us. We love you. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for saving us. And uh, thank you for loving us how you do. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, I'm of the notion that um, uh, revival is still uh, going to happen. Uh, I'm not of the uh, persuasion that since it is the last days that we cannot see any kind of revival. I, I hope you feel the same way. Um, and I would think that you do or else you wouldn't be at church on a Wednesday night. And uh, that being said, I believe, Brother William, that the people that God is, God is going to give revival to would be the people that are at church on a Wednesday night. And uh, not because they're better than the ones that only come on Sunday morning, but because I believe they have a desire. They have a hunger. They have a thirst. They have a, a want to. That's why you make the special effort to come to church again on a Wednesday night. And, uh, and I know there, I'm not being critical of those who aren't here tonight. I know in some situations you just can't. I know because of work and, and other reasons. And so I know that some are not here for legitimate reasons. So I'm not being critical necessarily of the ones who can't be here. I'm just trying to say that if you're here, you're here for a reason. You're, you're here because you want to and you want to get something from God. There might be some of you that are here because somebody made you come. And if that's the case, you need to thank God for that. You parents, you blew it right there. That was your chance to say amen. You, maybe you're scared. I don't know. But uh, I, I was, I'm glad that my parents made me go to church all the time. All the time we was going to church. And you know what's funny? Now as a grown man living on my own, I go to church all the time. All the time. You know why? I love it. I love it. I was in church yesterday from 9.30 in the morning until almost 9 o'clock last night. That's a true story. I'm not making that up. Drove up to Chattanooga for a big meeting. Heard five preachers from 9.30 a.m. up until about... Uh, I left at 4 o'clock. I had to leave in the middle of the service. My, my favorite, one of my favorite preachers, Brother Mark Stroud, was about to preach, and I had to leave uh, because I had to get back for Dad's meeting. Uh, he had Brother Carl Partain, and so we, we got back in time to be there for the, that night. And, uh, but I was in church all day yesterday. And you know why? Because I want something from God. And I, and I believe if you're here tonight, you're probably here because you want something from God. Now, that being said, as, a, as I study, I often, I've told you this before, often I, I write out the names of everyone I expect to be there. And I, I, have a, a, and I always throw the list away. I always throw the list away, and then every t- when I'm praying, I rewrite the list to, to keep the names and faces and needs that I know of fresh on my heart, if that makes sense. And, uh, and so there's a list that I write out for the Sunday morning that people I know will normally be there for Sunday morning. And, uh, and there's a list of folks that I know that will normally be here on a Wednesday night. And, uh, and so I write those names out and I, and I pray and I ask God, what do this person need? What does this father need? What does this husband need? What does uh, this wife need, this, this daughter, this son? What do they need from your word tonight? Does that make sense? And, uh, and so uh, I, I pray that way. And uh, I don't pray for what you want because that would be very easy to do. Um, I know there are probably a a group 
that would I could come and I could preach on the abominations. I could preach a hard message on um, sodomy or homosexuality or abortion or murder or drunkenness or anything like that. And, uh, and that would probably, you, you, would, you would enjoy that. You would want that. There's an appetite there for that because you're against those things. And, and so if, when, when someone says a lot of stuff real, real, real passionately that you already agree with, it's, that's, that's entertaining and that's, uh, that's, you have an appetite for that, if that makes sense. On the other end of that spectrum, I could preach uh, another way, and I could preach about you know loving the, the the drunkard, or loving the homosexual, or loving the 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 abortion person, or loving the you know that real wayward sinner. I could preach a message on compassion and love, and some of you would really that would whet your appetite because the idea of being against someone in that lifestyle is so it's so hard for you to swallow. It's so hard to be against something. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing either position. I'm just, I'm just trying to say that I could preach what we want and that would all be fun and we could all come in here and, and, uh, and say amen and holler and just get excited and say, yeah, that's great. But we wouldn't leave any different. And too much of church has just been echoing what we all already know, if, if that makes sense. And I don't want to just preach what we want. I, I honestly and sincerely ask God to give me what the church needs. And I, I pray for wisdom and I pray for enlightenment in the scriptures. And, and, uh, and God's laid this chapter on my heart. We preached from here a couple of weekends ago or a couple of Wednesdays ago rather on uh, the first rededication service in the Bible. We preached about being rededicated. How many of you, raise your hand, you were here for that message or you've listened to it on the internet so far. And uh, we preached about being rededicated and, and how uh, Simon Peter uh, has uh, rededicated his love to Christ here in John chapter 21. If you remember the story, this is where Jesus comes and says, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Lovest thou me? Lovest thou me? Three times. And, and Peter rededicates himself back to Christ, back to, the, back to God. And it's all about him loving God, not God loving him. And, uh, and the main statement that I made a few times in that message was, rededication is not about God loving you, but about you loving God. And uh, now, God loving you, that's salvation. But rededication, your commitment to Christ, is about your love for Him. And, uh, and so, But I want to get back into this chapter uh, tonight, and I want to preach to you on this thought of bring the fish. Bring the fish. Now, as uh, the apostles are, they're out there fishing in the middle of the night, and uh, morning has come, and we'll pick up reading in verse number 3, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a-fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught, say the next word, nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. And then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. And they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat about unto him, for he was naked, and he cast himself into the sea. And the other disciple came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. And Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. And so as these men had been fishing all night and they have caught nothing, Jesus shows up in the, as the sun begins to rise and tells them to cast their net on the other side of the ship and they catch a multitude of fish and they drag them back to shore and Jesus says, bring the fish, bring the fish. And so I want to look at this chapter a little bit tonight and I hope it will help you. Now much preaching has been devoted to John chapter 21. And one of the main areas that it's been uh, uh, focused on is reproving the disciples for going fishing when they should have been going to tell everybody that Jesus was alive. And, uh, and certainly, I, I guess I can, I, can see, I can see that because Jesus was alive, and then he died, and then he rose again, and he showed himself to them two times. And so certainly, they, that, they probably should have gone and went and told everybody they could find that you know, Jesus is alive. And somebody say amen. And certainly that's our job, is it not? 
Certainly that is our job. That is our job is to let people know that, hey, Jesus is alive. The gospel is true. Jesus loves you. He died for your sin. He is the, he is the only way um, out of hell, the only door into heaven. And uh, Jesus Christ is alive. And certainly we should be doing that. And I do want to say from the bottom of my heart as your pastor, I, I greatly appreciate those of you that made the extra effort to come and go out knocking on doors for those three weeks. I appreciate uh, you coming and helping us do just that. And uh, listen, let me tell you something. If somebody comes Sunday morning and gets saved, if somebody comes and gets saved, listen, that's going to add to your account in heaven. That's going to add to your account in heaven. I kind of hope that make you a little happier than it did. And, uh, but I don't know about you, but I want a big bank account in heaven. I know we all want big bank accounts down here and that would be nice, but I'd much rather be rich toward God than rich in the things of this world. And, uh, and so, yes, they should have been telling everybody about Jesus, and yes, but uh, as J.C. Ryle points out, that old Puritan, he said, the first thing we can notice about these men was their poverty. He said, because they're hungry, obviously, they don't have any money. Judas, we don't know what happened to the money Judas had. And so they got to go fish all night just to get some food and to try to make a dollar. And these were some pretty poor men. And uh, these were, these were ex-fishermen that probably didn't have a 401k. They retired, so to speak, very early, and they probably were not financially prepared for that. And they, they stepped out on faith to follow Christ, and they forsook their nets. They forsook their career, and uh, they didn't have a whole lot of money. And, uh, and so uh, while one side wants to just really beat them up, uh, uh, J.C. Ryle said, we well, ought to have a little bit of compassion for these guys having to go work in the middle of the night. I mean, these are the apostles that gave us the gospel. These are the apostles that gave us the book of Acts. These are the apostles that literally started the church, and, and, uh, and we owe them a great debt. And, uh, and so we can see their poverty, but we also see their, their personalities are, are shown up in here because when Jesus comes, and they, they don't know that it's him, and then John says, hey, that's Jesus, what does Peter do? He did the same thing he did last time Jesus came to them when they were in a boat. He gets out of the boat to go to Jesus. And the rest of them stay on board and drag the net up to the shore. And, and, and what I'm just trying to show you is that these men always reacted to Jesus differently. In good circumstances and bad circumstances, there, there's no duress going on in John 21. There's, there's no like super crazy danger. They're just fishing. They're probably frustrated, but they're not in danger. And uh, are you still with me tonight? And so... Uh, Peter jumps out of the boat, swims to shore. It's about 100 yards. It's 200 cubits, about 100 yards. Now, look, that is a long way to swim in a coat. Okay, all right. Peter's making a very dramatic effort to get back to Christ, very dramatic effort. And, uh, and, so, but, and the other guys stay on board the ship, and they, 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 they get the ship back to land. And I'm just showing you that there are differences in personalities, and we can see that all throughout the Gospels. We also, one more thing that J.C. Ryle brings up is that we see a, a, another proof, another proof that Christ did resurrect from the grave. And here we have another crystal clear example, these men giving eyewitness testimony to the resurrected Son of God. Another great proof, a, a very clear witness. They sit down and eat with him. And, uh, and as we showed you a couple weeks ago, Peter never forgot that. He never forgot that in the book of Acts, talking about sitting down and eating uh, with Jesus Christ. Uh, but I want to take this passage right briefly tonight, and I hope this will be a help to you, on this idea in verse number 10 of bring the fish. Now, I want you to read that verse again with me. Ready? Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. And, uh, and so Jesus comes to these disciples, and this is a great miracle, and there's a lot of instruction in it. And if you hold your eye, cover up one eye, and look at it from a, a particular angle, you can see, first off, something prophetic. I believe you can see something prophetic in this chapter, in this passage. I believe you can see a glimpse of the judgment seat of Christ in John chapter 21. That's what I believe. How many of you know what the judgment seat of Christ is? Raise your hand. The judgment seat of Christ, the church will be raptured out. And uh, after the rapture, all of the saved, dead and alive, will be gathered together and before Christ. 
and all of our efforts, all of the souls we've won, all of the messages we've preached, all of the offerings we've given, every good deed we have done, the entire bride of Christ will be tried right there before the judgment seat of Christ. And so I believe we can see a, a pretty good glimpse. Uh, again, I said if you cover one eye and look at it from a different angle, I believe you can see a glimpse of it. I believe that because, you, well, first off, it starts with the bodily absence of Christ. In the first few verses, Jesus is he's alive and he's just as well as he ever had been. He is resurrected, but he's not with them. And certainly we can relate to that. Amen. And, uh, and we know that Jesus is. We know that Jesus is alive, but he is not bodily with us. And so the absence of Christ, and there's an appearance of Christ. Uh, as the night comes to a close and as the morning comes, Jesus is standing on the shore and it caught them off guard. They were not prepared for it. They were not looking for it. He came as a thief in the night. They did not know he was there and he just kind of snuck up on them and that is exactly how the, the rapture will take place. There's not going to be a text sent out to all the saved that gives us an update or there will not be a calendar update on our iPhones that let us know, hey, Jesus is coming in seven days. Don't forget. There will be no update. He will come as a thief in the night and uh, he will step out and call us home and it will be a very uh, uh, shocking appearance for him. It will be a shocking disappearance for us but nonetheless, his appearance, and then we also see the differing arrivals of the disciples. The differing arrivals of the disciples. Now, I would have you notice that there's a particular disciple that is not here. His name is Judas. Jesus said he was a devil from the beginning. And when, listen, when we get to where Jesus is, there will be no devils. There will be no sinners. It will only be the saved. And he has called them. And, uh, and, and I want you to notice the different arrivals. As, as Peter gets out and he gets there first, he jumps out of the boat, swims to shore, and he gets there first, verse number 7. And then verse number 8, the other disciples came in a little ship. The other disciples came in a little ship. Now, it is my personal belief that the ships in the Gospels, even in the book of Acts, those ships are a picture of the church. They're a type and a picture of the church. And so Peter gets there first, and then the rest of the disciples come in after. A whole lot like those which uh, die in Christ are already there, but us that are alive and remain will be caught up together. And though we're all going to the exact same place, we get there at different times. And Peter gets there first, and the other disciples come in a little later. And they come in a little late, but in verse number 8, they come in very loaded. They come in very loaded. Because that other little ship came, and it says that they came dragging the net with fishes. They came dragging the net. Now, I'm going to need you to act really, really spiritual for this next few minutes because I need you to get on board with this because I was really excited about it in the office when I was studying, and I, I hope it's exciting to you. But this ship came in. It came in late, but it came in loaded, and it came in dragging the net with fishes. You know what those fish were? Those fish, <laughs> those fish were exactly what God just gave them. They had fished all night. They had caught absolutely nothing in their own strength, and their own power. But Jesus gave them every single one of those fish, and they drug those, uh, those fish all the way to the shore. And can I say that when they got there, they got there loaded. And they got there with everything Jesus had given them. And can I say that when the church finally gets to glory, and when the church finally gets to where Jesus is, we're going to bring everything that he's ever given us, every fish we've ever caught, every soul we've ever won to Christ, every husband that's gotten saved, every church member that's ever been baptized and ever been saved, we're going to bring everything Christ has given to us. And we'll bring everything we've ever caught before him at that judgment seat of Christ. I will say this, that Peter, though he went on before them, in verse number 11, Peter comes and helps them get that, get that net to shore and get them fish to Jesus after he says, bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Why is that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because Peter was a part of the original casting net. He was part of the original casting net, but he was not part of the dragging. He was part of the... Yeah, how about that? He was part of the original casting. All right, that's the book of Acts. All right? He was part of the original casting out, but he has not been a part of the dragging. See, that's what the church has been doing for so long. We've been, we've been dragging the, the souls, dragging the people through, through this world, dragging them through the water, going against the current, going against the waves, trying to get to shore, 
dragging, dragging the families and dragging the, the children and dragging. I hope you're not getting offended by the word dragging. I'm not trying to complain. I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, poor mouth. I'm just using the Bible word. We're, we're bringing all this stuff with us. And yes, it's laborsome. And yes, it's tiresome. And yes, it uh, uh, brings in heartache. And it takes, it takes hard work. And it takes labor. And it, it takes effort. And it don't just happen by accident. And Peter, he may not have been a part of the last several hundred years of church history, but he was a part of the original casting. He was there and preached that gospel message for the first time in the book of Acts. And can I say that when we get to heaven, when we finally get to where we're going and this whole thing wipes up or uh, winds up, the apostles and all those men from yesteryear, they'll join in with us and bring the fish to Jesus Christ. And then after that, verse number 12, he says, come and dine. And in case you didn't know... <laughs> After the rapture, after the judgment seat, there's something called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Y'all look this way. It's all right. Y'all look this way. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And we'll sit down and have a, a marriage supper with Jesus Christ. And again, we find Jesus serving and cooking. And that's exactly what he'll do in the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we can see something prophetic. But in verse number, verse number 4 and 5... We see something pitiful. We see something pitiful. These men have fished, and the way it looks, it looks like they fished till the morning. So I don't know what time they started, but I know what time they stopped. And they fished throughout the night and caught nothing. Now, they weren't fishing with Zebcos and bait casters. They were fishing with a casting net. How many have ever fished with a casting net before? Just a couple of you. I'll never forget one time when I was a boy, I uh, uh, had a, a friend in, in school, and he lived in Alabama, and I used to go over there and spend some time with him, and, and he said, hey, you want to go fishing? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'll grab my net. And for me, growing up fishing from a bass boat, when you say I'll grab my net, that's just the net on a stick that you, you know, scoop them out of the water with when you're getting them on the boat. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And so uh, as, as he said, I'll get my net, I just thought net on a stick. Well, he grabs a big old bag. I'm like, what is that? And it was a casting net. I'd never seen one before. And the uh, way it works, you, you cast it. It's very aptly named. And uh, you just throw it out in the water, and it's got weights on it, and it sinks, and everything that's in it, you just start dragging it back, and it, everything that's in that net, you, you draw to the shore. And I, I had never in my life seen one, never seen one. And I can tell you flat-footed, look you dead in the eyeball and tell you, that I caught so many fish with that little casting net. Never even seen it before. And I was wearing them out, man. Just wearing them out, left and right. Just about every single cast we was catching them. I had never seen one. This guy had just, just got it. It was brand new. He was no expert. He didn't do that for a living. But two teenage boys on the side of a creek in Alabama were catching fish left and right with a casting net. These are professional fishermen. These guys know what they're doing. They probably didn't buy their net at Walmart. They probably have bought theirs from the whatever the equivalent to Bass Pro Shop would have been for them in, the, in Nazareth or in Bethlehem. They, they, bought a, they had the good stuff. They had a ship. They weren't on the side of a creek. They were on a ship out there in the middle of the sea and where the big fish are, where there's a whole lot more fish. And these men fish all night long. They fish and they fish and they fish and they fish. They know how to do it. They're professionals. This is what they did for a living. They knew all the tricks of the trade. They knew all the little things that could make it easier. And they caught nothing. That's pitiful. I mean, that's just pitiful. What kind of... When Jesus comes and says, have you any meat? And they had to say, no. That's embarrassing. And I, I know we, we, we laugh and we kind of mock them for not catching anything, but, you know, I've been in church a long time. And I've been taught a lot of stuff. And I pretty much know what I'm supposed to do. Like, I know how to be a Christian. Okay, I know how to be a preacher. I know how to be a good husband. I know how to be a good daddy. I know how to be a prayer, to, to pray. I know, I know how to do the things I'm supposed to do. I know how to do it. How many of you would raise your hand and say, I know how to be a Christian? I, I know how to be a good husband. I know how to pray. I know, I know how to read my Bible. I know, I know how to study it. I, I know how to serve God. I know how to do it. 
just not very good at it. And be honest with you, someone that's been in church as long as I have and been under the preaching that I've been under and read the things I've read and seen the things I've seen, my net ought to be about to break. It ought to be. Now, I know you're thinking big church. That's not what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I ought to be a whole lot more spiritual than I am. I ought to have a whole lot more holiness. I ought to be a much better husband, a much better father. I mean, there is absolutely no excuse. And it's just flat out pitiful. Has uh, anyone else other than me uh, ever had to go through this thing where Jesus kind of says, how are you doing? Are you doing good? And you have to be honest and say no. I mean, here we are, 2019, with, with, with church buildings and, and, uh, and designated times of the week to go to church. And, and we, if you can't make it, you can watch it on the Internet and you can watch about a million sermons and a million Christian songs on, on your phone. You can drive down the road and listen to the best preaching and listen to the best worship music and the best God-honoring uh, uh, hymns. You can do that all the time. We have everything to make us succeed. <laughs> but we don't, and it's just flat out pitiful. Uh, it's just flat out pitiful. And I'm not just talking about, I'm talking about me. I'm talking about myself. Like, it's just flat out pitiful. Embarrassing even. Embarrassing to have to tell God, no, I haven't succeeded yet. No, my net's still empty. Just pitiful. And while you probably have never fished with a casting net, you have certainly failed at doing what you already know how to do. Please, God. And to be honest with you, it's just, it's just pitiful. You say, no, we're not pitiful. Well, I remind you, just watch the news. Just look at the young people that we're raising. You tell me it's not, we're not pitiful. Brother Chris Simpson said, uh, was, well, I don't know when he said it. I heard him say it today on the Internet. He said, he said, it used to be we had to tell the church how to behave in the world. Now we have to tell the church how to behave in church. And you, just, you, just, you can just look. Look at what we're producing. Look at the generation that we're living in. It's pitiful. It really is. But thank God it doesn't end in verse number 5. Somebody say Amen. Jesus said unto them, have you Children, have you any meat? And they answered him, No. And he said, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. And, uh, and so thank God it doesn't end right there. And I will say before I move on, it's very clear from verse number 4, 5, and 6 that without Jesus we can do nothing. Even if we know how to do it, even if we got the equipment and we got the structure and we got the manpower, we got everything we knew to be able to do it, we even have learned how to do it. But just because you know how, without Christ we can do nothing. You can have the finest set of books to teach you how to be a Christian, but without the power of Jesus Christ, you can do nothing. You can have the best medicine to help your mind stay clear, but without Jesus, you can do nothing. You can have the best self-help books on how to be a better husband or how to be a better wife or how to be a better parent or how to be a better this or better that, but without Jesus, we can do nothing. Nothing whatsoever. And so he tells them, cast it on the right side and... They do, and they draw it for a multitude of fishes. And so in verse number 10, he tells them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Now, do you know what those fish are? Those fish are what Jesus just gave them. He just gave them those fish. But... He doesn't say, bring of the fish which I gave you. He says, bring of the fish which ye have now caught. So we saw something prophetic, something pitiful. I want you to see, lastly, something personal. Something personal. He says, bring the fish. Bring the fish that you've caught. Bring the fish. Bring, let me say it this way, bring the fruit of your own obedience. 
bring the results from you doing what I told you to do. Is that not what happened? They're fishing one way. He says, no, fish this way. They fished that way. They caught fish. Right? He says, bring those. Bring that personal fruit from your personal obedience. Bring that to me. Bring it up here. Let's look at it. Bring these fish up here and let's look at them. These fish were the fruit of their obedience. So I encourage you tonight, bring the fish. Bring the fruit that God's given you in your life. What's God done in you? What has God done through you? What has God changed in you? What have you obeyed and done and what has it produced? Let me say it this way. Bring the results from the last decision you made for Christ. Bring the results from the last decision you made for Christ. Bring the fruit. Bring the results. Bring that personal fruit of your own salvation. Let's bring it up and let's talk about it. Bring it to Christ and let's look at it. Can I say that's exactly what we're going to do at the judgment seat of Christ? We're going to get there, and if all you've done is just get saved and never do anything else, you have nothing but what He gave you. You have nothing but your soul to bring to Him. Bring the fish. Bring the fish. Bring up the fruits of your obedience. Verse number 11, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty and three. So bring the fish and let's count them. Bring the fruits of your life, bring the fruits of your salvation, bring the fruits of the Spirit that are in your life, and let's count them. We'll see how many we got. Why, why, why count them? Why did, why did Christ count them? Why did John, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, write down the number? They counted them, specifically. They counted and handled each one. So bring the fish... Let's count them. What's God done in you since you got saved? You think, well, I, don't, I, don't ha- I haven't won anyone to Christ. Okay, well, that'll come. But who have you forgiven? What sin have you got the victory over? What Bible verse has really helped you? Bring the fish. Bring it up. Let's get it up here. Get it up. Let's count it. Count how many things God's done through you. Count how many things God has added into your life. Let's let's bring them up. Bring the fish. Let's count them. Let's count them, Mama. Let's, 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 Let's bring this stuff up. Because a lot of times God's done a lot of stuff through us and in us, and we look right past it. And we discount everything. So bring it up. Let's bring the fish. Let's count them. Let's not just count them. Go on in the verse. Verse number 12, Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. Let's sit down. Let's celebrate them. Let's sit down and talk about them. Let's sit down and celebrate. Let's celebrate all that God's done through us. Let's celebrate that bitterness you finally got over. Let's celebrate that, 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 that racism you finally got past. Let's celebrate that, that anger you finally got control over. Let's celebrate those things that God's done in you. Let's celebrate that. Bring the fish and let's rejoice. I don't know a fisherman that fishes, that catches fish, and doesn't get excited about catching the fish. I don't know, I, but, but somehow we know Christian after Christian after Christian that God brings something into their life and they act like nothing ever happened, nothing's ever changed. What I want you to do is bring the fish and let's celebrate what God's done in you since He saved you. Let's celebrate how He's worked on you. Let's celebrate that temper you got control over. Let's celebrate that addiction you got the victory over. Let's celebrate that gift He gave you. I was reading in 1 Corinthians, and it was talking about how they come behind in no gift. Some of you know the verse I'm talking about. Then he says, and it confirmed the testimony of Christ in you. Can I say that we got some very gifted people in our church? You know what that is? That's the testimony of Christ in you. He's given you a spiritual gift. Let's bring it up. Let's Let's rejoice over. Let's celebrate the fish that God has given us. Let's celebrate them. Let's count them. Let's consume them. 
Jesus said, come and dine, and then he starts feeding them fish. Now, he already had some fish there on the coals, but I don't necessarily know that he had enough to feed them all, and I got them fish that he just, they just brought and fed them. He fed them from their own fish, from their own fruit, from their very own fruit. So tonight I think it would be very good for you to bring the fish. You say, well, I just don't know what fish you're talking about. Well, James, you got that verse up there, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. This is the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. All right, so let's bring that fish up. Let's bring that fish up. God, has God put love in you? Let's bring that up. Let's count it. Let's celebrate it. Let's let it encourage us. Love, joy, joy. You know, that might be one of my favorite fruits of the Spirit, Brother William, is joy. Because I definitely know when I don't have my joy. I definitely know when I don't have my joy. And let me just tell you something, it's horrible. Life without that fruit is flat out depressing and horrible. Not to have that fruit of the Spirit of joy. Some of you know what that real joy is like. And it don't come from possessions, it comes from the goodness of God. The goodness of God. The joy. Let's bring that fish up. Has God given you joy? Let's bring it up. Bring it up. Joy. Peace. Peace. There's a lot of us that don't have that. There's a lot of us that do. Let's bring that peace up and let's praise God for it. Long-suffering. Long-suffering. That's a work of the Spirit that God has been working on me over the last several years. And like the little song, He's still working on me. Amen. I'm not professing to have all that down. Gentleness. Gentleness. Goodness. Goodness. Faith. Meekness. Temperance. Self-control. Self-control. Listen to me. When you got saved, your body didn't, right? Does everyone understand that? Your soul got saved, but your body didn't. Your eyes didn't. Your mind didn't. Your hands didn't. Your mouth didn't. Your tongue, your taste buds, your appetites. That did not get saved. That was not changed. So what is not changed must be controlled. What is not changed must be controlled. Paul said, I bring my body into subjection. I bring my body into subjection. What is not changed must be controlled. That's what, that's what temperance is, self-control. So bring up the fish. Bring the, bring the fish. You see, a lot of times we have it in our head that if we're not the pastor or if we're not some like, well-known uh, uh, gospel singer or like, you know, globe-trotting missionary, that you know, we're really not that, eh, we don't really mean much, and we're not a very good Christian. But you can have every single one of those fruits of the Spirit and never preach a single sermon. You can never visit another country. Are you listening? You can have all of those and not, never be a pastor, Never be a Sunday school teacher. You can just be a Christian. And God is over the moon about that. Bring the fish. Bring the fish. What I was kind of trying to get to Sunday morning on, the, on the, that, that, that fruit tree, that when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. I was trying to get there, but uh, to be honest with you, Sunday morning I felt like I was preaching in a straitjacket and uh, was... You, Brother William knows what I'm talking about. Brother Robert probably knows what I mean about no liberty. But there's fruit in our lives that's there that we can that be to be encouraged from. Fruit to we can consume it. We can we can go to it and lean on it and be fed from it. And so bring the fish, bring the fish, bring it up, bring it to Christ. Talk about it. Bring it up. Bring up these fruits. You say, well, I only have like two of them. Well, that's a good start because I know Christians with none of them. I know saved people with no fruits of the Spirit. That's, that, that's why in, uh, is 1 Peter or 2 Peter, add to your faith, and he lists just about this same list. Is it 1 or 2 Peter? I think it's 2 Peter chapter 1, I believe. Add to your faith. See, he's, he's given to every man a measure of faith. 
Every man. Faith. It's up to you to add to it. So you can be a saved Christian and not have any of these things. That, might, that may be you. That may be you. Were those disciples saved, yes or no? Before, the whole, before they caught the fish, saved, yes or no? It's not a trick question. Yes, they were saved. Christ has already breathed them. They've already received the Holy Ghost. They were already saved. Yet they were fishing with no fish. I believe that, I believe that fits a lot of saved people. I believe that fits a lot of church members. Fishing with no fish. No fruit. I hope that's not you. If it is, you're not going to get it on your own. Just like those disciples that had to have Christ. Christ had to give them to them. So get your list. Bring your fish. Bring it up. Bring it up. Let's stand to our feet.